I'm Kate, and I was raised in a modest home that was always filled with the aroma of freshly baked bread. After school, I enjoyed helping Dad knead bread at the family bakery that he inherited from his parents. Mom was different. She made more money than Dad ever did as a realtor, always wearing dapper suits and high heels. When I was 12 years old, gangly and ungainly, and more interested in reading than anything else, Mom phoned one evening and said, Kate, come set the table. On the way, as I spread out the dishes, I dog-eared my page and screamed back. They started up again, I heard. Another slow month, Mom said in a tone full of contempt, When are you going to straighten up? Dad's response was kind. Please, Sarah, don't stand in front of Kate. Oh, who gives a damn? Mom lost her temper. She ought to be aware of her father's lack of success. I held on to the table's edge and forced myself to hold back my tears. In our home, it was typical to see Mom making fun of Dad while Dad tried to maintain harmony. I was aware that Mom felt stuck in a life she never desired and was upset about more than simply money. Kate. Mom gave a bark. Where is my wine? With trembling hands, I quickly poured her a drink and put it down. The tablecloth was splattered with some. Mom's eyes blinked. You worthless girl. Is there nothing you can do correctly? Dad stepped in. Sarah, it's only a little wine. Nothing was harmed. Mom gave him a fierce look. You treat her too leniently. It's no surprise that she's becoming as pitiful as you. I buried my face in my pillow and ran to my bed. I had a deep affection for Dad, but I didn't understand why he tolerated Mom's behavior. For my part, I had mastered the art of being as discreet and silent as possible. When I woke up the following morning, the home was oddly quiet. No click of Mom's shoes, no scent of bread baking. Dad was seated at the kitchen table, his face pale as I slipped downstairs. Where is Mom? I inquired, even though I had a strong feeling that I already knew the answer. Dad handed me a note in Mom's beautiful handwriting without saying a word. John, I can't do this anymore, it said. I'm taking Richard with me. Instead of this all-town bullshit, he can offer me the life I deserve. Kate, you're simply dead weight that I don't need, so don't even attempt to locate me. You're a loser, John, and you've also made our daughter into one. Goodbye and goodbye. I felt as though I had been hit in the gut as I gazed at the page. Mom had left us, calling Dad a loser and me worthless in her farewell statement. The ensuing months were a haze of court cases and psychological distress. Dad petitioned to have Mom's parental rights revoked and filed for divorce. As we waited for Mom to arrive, I recall sitting in the chilly courthouse with my sweating hand gripping Dad's. She didn't. As the grown-up spoke, I fell asleep, only to pick up on phrases like abandonment and unfit parent. Dad squeezed my hand when it was done. It's finished, Katie, he acknowledged quietly. Your mother's parental rights have been terminated, and the divorce is official. Now it's just the two of us. With a mixture of relief and regret, I nodded. After that, life became more difficult. Dad put in a lot of effort and worked long hours in the bakery. I did the most of the chores even though I was only 12. After doing my homework when I got home from school, I would begin making supper and doing the wash. This pattern lasted for three years before things altered once more shortly after my 15th birthday. One day, Dad arrived home with a look of astonishment and sadness on his face. As he collapsed onto a kitchen chair, he muttered, Uncle Pete died. I gave him a strong embrace and whispered, Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. He gave me a hug in return. Then with wide eyes, he withdrew. You won't believe this, Katie. He bequeathed me about $300,000. His sole surviving relative is me. I'm not sure how to handle it all. 
However, Dad immediately figured it out. He used some of the funds to extend the menu and upgrade the bakery's equipment. Our small bakery became the buzz of the town in a matter of months. Before we realized it, Dad was establishing a second site across town, hiring additional employees and extending the hours. Dad had three successful bakeries by the time I was 16. Our concerns about money were vanished. I gave up my after-school employment to concentrate on my education. We even traveled to Europe for two weeks, which was our first actual vacation. Over the years, Mom faded into the background. Although Dad dated from time to time, he never showed any desire in getting married again. We were content just the way we were, so I didn't push it. High school graduation passed quickly, filled with tears and cap flinging. I had put in a lot of effort, and it had paid off. I was on my way to study finance at State University. Dad gave me a little package the morning I was scheduled to go. What is this? I opened it to discover a key and asked. Dad smiled. Your present for graduating. It's an apartment close to the university. Rent and dorm life are no longer concerns. I was dumbfounded when I looked at him. I can't, Dad. This is excessive. I protested, but he waved me away. Katie, you deserved it. Go now and make me proud. College went by quickly. Determining to take use of the chance Dad had given me, I poured myself into my studies. I was working as an intern at nearby financial businesses while I wasn't in class or studying. I had a junior financial analyst position lined up by the time I graduated. I was standing in front of my apartment mirror on my first day of work, smoothing my blazer. Kate, you've got this, I said to my mirror. Make your father proud. Although the work was difficult, I enjoyed it. Instead of spending every bonus or increase I received, I invested it. I kept hearing Dad say, Katie, money makes money. Use it wisely. Years passed. By the time I hit 32, those smart investments had paid off. I owned two more apartments in addition to the one I lived in, all bringing in steady rental income. Life was good. Then came the phone call that changed everything. Katie, Dad's voice sounded strained. Can you come over? I need to talk to you about something. I found him sitting at his kitchen table, looking older than I'd ever seen him. What is it, Dad? I asked, fear clenching my stomach. He took a deep breath. It's cancer, honey. Stage four. The world tilted on its axis. No, I whispered. There must be some mistake. But there wasn't. The next year was a hellish roller coaster of treatments, remissions, and relapses. I spent every free moment at the hospital or at Dad's house, making his favorite cheese soup, even when he was too nauseous to eat it. One crisp autumn day, I arrived at Dad's house to find him sitting in his favorite armchair, a serious look on his face. We need to talk, Katie, he said, patting the seat next to him. The doctors gave me six months, tops. No, I said, shaking my head furiously. They're wrong. We'll get a second opinion. Katie, he interrupted gently. It's okay. I've made my peace with it. I'm selling the bakeries. Everything's going to you. You'll be set for life. I pulled back, wiping my eyes. I don't want your money, Dad. I want you. He smiled sadly. I know, sweetheart, but this is how I can take care of you even when I'm gone. The next seven months were precious and painful. We talked more than we ever had about everything and nothing. I memorized every line on his face, the sound of his laugh, the smell of sugar and flour that clung to him. Then on a quiet Wednesday morning, he was gone. The funeral was a blur. Afterward, I sat in Dad's empty house, clutching his favorite apron. The lawyer had already been by with the paperwork. True to his word, Dad had left me everything. 
I used the money from the bakeries to buy two more apartments. It felt right somehow, building something lasting just like Dad had done. A year after Dad's passing, I was just starting to find my footing again. Work kept me busy, and managing my rental properties gave me a sense of purpose. I'd settled into a new normal, or so I thought. Then came the call that turned everything upside down. Kate, it's, it's your mother. I'm back in town. I'd like to see you if you're willing. My mind raced. Part of me wanted to hang up to protect myself from the woman who'd abandoned me. But another part, the part that still held on to the little girl I once was, cool to help but be curious. Okay, I heard myself say. Let's meet at Rosie's Cafe tomorrow at noon. The next day, I arrived at the cafe early, my stomach in knots. As the clock struck 12, I saw her walk in. She looked older, of course, but still elegant. But she wasn't alone. A young girl, maybe 17, trailed behind her. Mom spotted me and hurried over. Kate, darling, you look wonderful. And this is Lily, your sister. I felt like I'd been slapped. My what? We sat down, and Mom launched into her story. How her lover Richard had left her shortly after Lily was born. How they'd struggled to make ends meet. And how she decided to come back to her hometown to start over. I heard you have a rental property, she continued, her voice hopeful. I was wondering if maybe. She trailed off, but her meaning was clear. I looked at Lily, who was staring at her hands, clearly uncomfortable. I thought about Dad, about how he'd always taught me to be kind even when it was hard. I thought about the scared little girl I used to be, wishing for her mom to come back. Okay, I heard myself say. I have a unit that's just become available. You can stay there. Mom's face lit up. Okay, thank you. We'll pay rent, of course. I held up a hand. No rent, just utilities for now. As we hammered out the details, I watched Lily. She looked so young, so out of place. I remembered being her age, feeling lost and alone after mom left. So Lily, I said, trying to sound friendly, you're what, a junior in high school? She nodded, meeting my eyes for the first time. Yeah, it's weird starting at a new school for senior year. I felt a pang of sympathy. I bet. Listen, if you need help with anything, school stuff, or just someone to talk to, I'm here. Okay, Lily gave me a small smile. Thanks, that means a lot. As we left the cafe, Mom hugged me again. You're an angel, Kate. I know I have a lot to make up for but I hope we can start fresh. I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. That night, as I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't shake the feeling that my life was about to get a lot more complicated. But for better or worse, my mother was back in my life, and I had a sister. Only time would tell what that would mean for all of us. The months following Mom and Lily's return were strange. Mom quickly found work as a realtor, slipping back into her old life as if she'd never left. Lily enrolled in the local high school for her senior year. I kept my distance, unsure how to navigate this new family dynamic. Occasionally, Mom would call or stop by. Kate, darling, thank you again for the apartment. She gush, her smile wide and seemingly sincere. You've been such a blessing. I'd nod, uncomfortable with her effusive gratitude. It's fine, Mom. I'm glad I could help. Lily and I developed a cautious friendship. I'd help her with math homework or listen to her college plans. It was nice, in a way, having a sister. But there was always a barrier, the weight of the years we'd missed. Then came Lily's graduation. I attended the ceremony, watching from the back as she accepted her diploma. Mom beamed with pride, and for a moment, I allowed myself to imagine what life might have been like if she'd never left. The very next day, Mom showed up at my door unannounced. 
Her face was flushed, eyes blazing. We need to talk, she snapped, pushing past me into the living room. I followed, confused. What's going on? I asked. She whirled on me. Don't play dumb. I know about the apartments, Kate, all four of them. My stomach dropped. How had she found out? What about them? I asked, keeping my voice level. You've been holding out on us, she shrieked, living the high life while Lily and I scraped by. I felt my temper rising. Excuse me. You're living rent-free in one of those apartments. That's not enough, she spat. Half of those properties should be mine. I'm your mother. I couldn't help it. I laughed. It was so absurd. You can't be serious. You lost any claim to my property when you abandoned us, remember. No parental rights. No child support. She changed tack, then her voice suddenly pleading. Kate, sweet, think about Lily. She needs money for college. If you just sold one apartment. Absolutely not. I cut her off. Lily's education is not my responsibility. How can you be so selfish? Mom wailed. After everything I've done for you. That was the last straw. Everything you've done for me. I repeated, incredulously, you mean abandoning me, calling me useless in your goodbye note? Or wait, do you mean living rent-free in my apartment for months? Mom recoiled as if I'd slapped her. For a moment, she just stared at me, her mouth opening and closing like a fish out of water. Then, without another word, she turned and stormed out, slamming the door behind her. I stood there, shaking with anger and hurt. How dare she? After everything, how dare she try to guilt me like this? I sank onto the couch, my head in my hands. I'd known deep down that letting mom back into my life was a risk. But I'd hoped, well, I wasn't sure what I'd hoped for. As the adrenaline faded, I felt a deep, aching sadness. This woman, who should have been my protector, my support, was nothing but a stranger who wanted to use me. And Lily, what was I going to do about Lily? Two weeks after Mom's blow-up, I was grabbing coffee at my usual spot when I noticed the barista giving me odd looks. As I waited for my order, I overheard a snippet of conversation from a nearby table. Can you believe it? Charging her own mother rent when she's got all those apartments. I froze, sure they couldn't be talking about me, but they were. Over the next few days, I caught more whispers, more sidelong glances. It seemed Mom had been busy spreading her twisted version of events to anyone who would listen. Then came the Facebook post. I saw it during my lunch break and nearly choked on my sandwich. My daughter Kate has four apartments she rents out, making a fortune but refuses to help pay for her sister's college education. She's forcing me to pay exorbitant rent when I can barely make ends meet. I'm heartbroken that my own child could be so greedy and selfish. The comments poured in, each one a knife to my heart. How could she do that to her own mother? What a horrible person. I always knew there was something off about her. Friends, relatives, even old classmates I hadn't spoken to in years. All of them jumped on the bandwagon, shaming me for my supposed greed. Not one of them seemed to remember or care that this woman had abandoned me as a child. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, my boss called me into his office. Kate, he said, his face grave, we need to talk about this situation with your mother. It's starting to affect the company's reputation. I felt the blood drain from my face. Sir, I can explain. He held up a hand. I'm not asking for details, but I need you to resolve this quietly and quickly. We can't have this kind of drama associated with our firm. Understand? I nodded numbly, not trusting myself to speak. Back at my desk, I found an email notification about unpaid utilities for mom's apartment. Great, just great. With shaking hands, I dialed mom's number. 
What do you want? She snapped by way of greeting. I took a deep breath, trying to keep my voice steady. Mom, there are unpaid utility bills for your apartment. We agreed you'd cover those, remember? She scoffed. Oh, please, you're rolling in money from all those apartments. You can afford to pay a few bills. That's not the point, I said, my patience wearing thin. We had an agreement. An agreement, she interrupted. Like the agreement that you'd help your family? That lot of good that did us. I sat there, phone in hand, feeling like the world was crumbling around me. How had I let things get this far? I tried to do the right thing, to be kind and generous, and this was how I was repaid. With a heavy heart, I made an appointment with a lawyer. Miss Stevens, the lawyer said, reviewing my case, you have every right to evict your mother. She has no lease, pays no rent, and you've given her ample notice. Notice about the utility bills. I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and dread. What do I need to do? He handed me a document. This is an official eviction notice. Serve it to her, and if she doesn't comply, we can take legal action. Armed with the paper, I drove to Mom's apartment. My apartment, really. My hands shook as I knocked on the door. Mom answered, her face twisting with displeasure when she saw me. Oh, it's you. Have you finally come to your senses about selling an apartment for Lily's college? Lily's picked out her school. Tuition's due next month. My shock turned to anger. Are you serious right now? After everything you've done, you're still making demands. Don't be so dramatic, Mom scoffed. It's the least you can do for family. That was it, the last straw. I thrust the eviction notice at her. Here you have 30 days to vacate the premises. Mom stared at the paper, her face going pale. Then without warning, she exploded. You ungrateful little brute. She screamed, her voice echoing through the apartment. After everything I've done for you. I stood my ground. Everything you've done? You mean abandoning me, spreading lies about me? She lunged forward, her hand raised. I flinched, but the blow never came. Instead, she grabbed the front of my shirt, spitting insults in my face. You're nothing, you hear me? Nothing but a selfish heartless. I managed to break free, fumbling for my phone. That's it, I'm calling the police. Mom's eyes widened, but she didn't back down. She continued her tirade, her words becoming more vicious with each passing second. When the police arrived, I was shaking, tears streaming down my face. I showed them the eviction notice and explained the situation as calmly as I could. One officer said to Mom, I suggest you calm down and discuss this civilly with your daughter. Mom sneered, with her? She's trying to throw us out on the street. The other officer turned to me. Miss Stevens, legally this is a civil matter. We can't forcibly remove her without a court order. I'd suggest trying to work this out between yourselves or taking it to court if necessary. I nodded, feeling defeated. As the police left, Mom's triumphant smirk made my blood boil. You won't do it, she taunted. You don't have the guts to take your own mother to court. I stared at her, this woman who had given birth to me, but had never truly been a mother. In that moment, I felt something inside me harden. Watch me, I said, my voice low and steady. Before she could respond, I turned and walked away. As I reached my car, I heard the slam of the apartment door behind me. As I drove home, I thought about what lay ahead. A court battle, more drama, more pain, but also maybe a chance to finally break free from the toxic hold my mother had over me. The day of the court hearing arrived, and I felt like I might throw up. As I walked into the courtroom, I saw Mom and Lily sitting on the opposite side. Mom's eyes were red and puffy, while Lily looked like she wanted to disappear. The proceedings began, and Mom put on quite a show. She wept dramatically, 
her voice breaking as she addressed the judge. Your Honor, she sobbed, my daughter has become so cold-hearted. She's trying to throw her own mother and sister out on the streets after everything I've done for her. I clenched my fists, willing myself to stay calm. Then my lawyer stood up, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Your Honor, he began, his voice steady and confident. I'd like to present some evidence that paints a very different picture of the situation. He proceeded to lay out the facts. Mom's abandonment when I was 12, the termination of her parental rights, her failure to pay any child support. He showed the judge the documentation of the rent-free arrangement and the unpaid utility bills. But he wasn't done. Furthermore, Your Honor, we have evidence that Mrs. Stevens is not in fact in the dire financial straits, she claims. Mom's head snapped up, her eyes wide. My lawyer continued, Mrs. Stevens owns an apartment in another city, left to her by her former partner. She currently rents out this property for a substantial monthly income. There was silence in the courtroom. With a severe frown, the judge turned to face Mom. Mrs. Stevens, is this accurate? Mom was looking pale. After opening and closing her mouth many times, she said, Yes, Your Honor. When the judge handed down his decision, his voice was icy. The eviction is granted by this court. In addition, Mrs. Stevens shall reimburse the rent for the month she lived in the flat without paying rent. Your behavior, Mrs. Stevens, is absolutely unacceptable. This case is over. With a resounding sound that seemed to reverberate throughout my body, the gavel fell. We had won, and it was over. I saw Lily as we were leaving the courthouse. My heart hurt for her because she appeared lost and perplexed. She was not at blame for this. Ignoring Mom's scowl, I approached her. I'm sorry it came to this, Lily, I murmured quietly. You may still get in touch with me if you need assistance, actual aid, okay? With tears in her eyes, she nodded. I apologize, Kate, I was unaware. I smiled sadly at her and turned to go feeling as though a burden had been removed. Over the next few weeks, Mom and Lily left my flat. Through rumors, I learned that they had moved into Mom's other home. Neither they nor I made an effort to get in touch. Memories of the previous few months raced through my head as I stood in the now empty apartment. The anxiety of the court case, the anguish of Mom's treachery, and the joy I'd had when she returned but I felt liberated beneath it all.